Hello, everyone. This is Will Olds, and thank you for attending this refresher course on Western blotting. We're going to start here in a couple of moments while we let the rest of the people roll in here. And uh, I just want to note, uh, while we're going through this, we have um, some handouts that are available. Uh, the one is just about us in general, and the other one's just kind of our longer Western blot uh, guide, which has more detailed steps on how to do uh, Western blotting. So we'll just wait a couple more moments here, and then we'll get started. All right, then let's begin here. As I said, this is a refresher course. I know a lot of you have unfortunately had to be away from the lab for a little bit due to the uh, ongoing pandemic, but I know that many of you are back in the lab and now you need to uh, refresh yourself on what the heck uh, Western blotting even is. And so this course is uh, just gonna be very short, about 30 minutes or so, just to kind of remind you about some tips and tricks for getting a uh, better Western blot. And so I'm the scientific officer here at Protein Tech, and I am delighted to walk you through this. All right. Okay, so for those of you who don't know too much about Protein Tech, um, we have eight antibodies against 13,000 human targets. That represents both po rabbit polyclonal, mouse monoclonal, and recombinant antibo rabbit recombinant antibodies. We have 200 plus ELISA kits. Uh, covering uh, a wide array of cytokines, growth factors, and other important proteins. We also sell uh, a line of human cell express cytokines and growth factors called human kinds. We also offer uh, fluorescent dye contributed antibodies to our core life proprietary dye. We also offer some neutralizing antibodies against cytokines and growth factors, as well as some pre stained uh, protein markers that you definitely need for every Western bot that you do. All of our products are 100% manufacturing validated in-house. We recently received ISO 9001 and 13485 accreditation for GMP uh, production. We have five sites globally with full product inventory, which means wherever, basically wherever you are in the world, we're able to get you an antibody the next day. Our, our products have been cited over 65,000 times in publications worldwide. We have GMP grade products available, and we are big on supporting the scientific community with mentorship awards, travel grants, workshops like this, and more. And so, um, our slogan at Protein Tech is, it's, it's everything is from our bench to your bench. And so what that means is that we, everything that we make, we sell. So we don't sell to a reseller who sells to you. We sell, we bypass all that and sell directly, taking it straight from our bench to your bench. <clears throat> So what this means for you is that um, we're able to really have a great, greater uh, emphasis on our quality control, as well as being able to provide a safe, a stable supply of products to you. So we also, so I also like to say that validation is our middle name here, Protein Tech. So we have a stringent validation pro process. We're the first company to launch siRNA uh, knockdown validation in about 2016. And in 2016, we won an award depicted on the right here of most exciting antibody validation initiative by uh, CIDAB. And uh, because we were the first and we continue to work hard at this, we, are, we have the broadest coverage of antibody targets with specificity verified by knockdown and knockout validation. And because, again, we make everything, we're able to provide uh, transcribed lab notebook pages in the form of our antibody specific protocol. And so our goal really is to help you have success. And so we're really delighted to have uh, allowed people to have many uh, cover, cover stories and journals, as well as, well as being cited in over 65,000 uh, pub journals and publications worldwide. <clears throat> All right, so now to the, to the meat, meat and potatoes of the refresher course here. The goal of this course is to have a greater insight into the biochemistry of Western blotting understanding how modulating each step affects the results, and just have more tools in your mental toolbox for troubleshooting. So in terms of what we're gonna go through here, I'm gonna start with just kind of a refresher. How do I do this thing again? I haven't picked up a pipe pen in three months. What is this? Uh, and then how to banish background, 
making sense of extra bands, strengthening signal, dealing with small molecular weight proteins, um, doing some of their tweaks, as well as just a little quick summary at the end here. So just to kind of remind you of what you're doing in Western blotting, again, more detail for each of these steps is in one of the handouts uh, on this webinar is that you start out by resolving your proteins on that page gel. You transfer it from your gel to a membrane. You then block, you then block the membrane and add your primary antibody, wash it, wash it off, add the secondary, wash again, and then you and then you image the final product. So what are the sources of high background? And unfortunately, it's really in a lot of different spots here. And really all these different steps can add to background. But let me just kind of go through kind of what the biochemistry of not specific binding looks like. So here's your protein that you're interested in. And you found a really great antibody that binds to this epitope over here depicted by this antibody. And another one over here depicted by this antibody uh, here. And another one on the third. So let's say that the KD of this polyclonal antibody is about 10 to the minus nine uh, molar. So this is kind of the average KD for an antibody. Let's say that there are some other proteins uh, that are in this that are uh, in this in the cell that look like this. That are pretty similar. That have like an epitope that kind of looks like these guys. It has one amino acid difference, and the KD is much worse, 10 to the minus four. So there is affinity, but it's pretty weak. Now let's look at the at the concentrations of these proteins. So for here. Your favorite protein may be have a very very low abundance, so even even lower than what the KD is. And for here and um, these other proteins, they might be really really high, so exaggerated here as one molar. And so what that means is that this antibody, despite being relatively specific for here, it may actually bind to these uh, proteins non-specifically. So this is kind of an issue that you may have to think about when you're designing your experiments in terms of how to uh, mitigate this. So um, I'll, I'll express some, I'll show some ways to do that later on here. Okay. And so if you add lots of antibodies, it's, it's obviously going to, it can, it can obviously exacerbate the problem. All right. And so sometimes I see a lot of blots that come to come to my desk looking like this, right? Just kind of everything. It just looks like it stained every single protein on here, like the, like the ladder. And so why does this happen? Why? How could it be possible that anybody could even make an antibody that can bind everything? And has to again, this has to do with biochemistry. So on the y-axis here is the percentage of bound protein. And on the x-axis is just the free and bound amount total protein. Okay, and so I also showed kind of three curves here. So this first curve is an antibody binding curve that's relatively high affinity. So you don't have to add too much protein to get a pretty high bound amount. And on purple here, I have a one of medium affinity. And then on the, this red one, I have for very low affinity. And importantly, I have this linear curve that is non-specific binding. Non-specific binding is linear as opposed to these uh, healthy curves that shoot upward for antibodies. So as you can tell, if you add a very, very small amount of antibody, there is the non-specific binding is relatively high. And so what you want to do is you want to add enough protein such that you're looking at here on the curve or here on the curve as so it's much higher than the non-specific binding, and so that your signal to noise ratio will be much will be much stronger. And then I know, and then you can see here for this low affinity antibody, you're going to have to add a lot of a lot of protein before you're able to uh, see the uh, specific binding that's more uh, energetically favorable than non-specific binding. All right, so. What this means for your Western blot experiments is that you need to experiment with how much protein you're loading and how, and how much antibody you're adding into the, you're adding to your membrane. So as I've kind of described, background is unfortunately a consequence of biochemistry. These aren't magical robots that uh, find your protein. Uh, th these are chemical these are chemicals, and so they are guided by the principles of biochemistry. But it can be mitigated. So 
one of the major things is to optimize your license buffer. We have uh, various protocols on how to do this on pgglab.com. And then also to titrate your primary antibody, as I mentioned. You can increase your blocking time. We recommend doing overnight blocking if it's at all possible. I know it's tough. Western blotting already takes about two days for most people. We also recommend uh, if you're having a lot of trouble with background to increase your milk, your, your non-fat milk concentration to about 7%. Uh, again, you could, you've probably already done this, but always use a low exposure time if you're getting a lot of background that can usually help. Uh, washing can also have a bit of a can also help using 20 minutes or longer and kind of using fresh, fresh washing buffer each time. And something else to consider is if your protein is of low abundance is to do an IP or fractionate into the different organelles to decrease not competitive non-specific binding. Kind of, in other words, kind of get rid of the competition uh, for binding for your antibody. Okay, so we've already talked about how we do this again, how to banish background. Now we're going to talk about making sense of extra bands. So occasionally on Western Blight, you see like all these bands, you're like, why are there just so many bands here? All right, so, so one explanation is described here. So let's say you have an antibody and it binds to all these different epitopes here, and you have this dastardly uh, protease in here, and it cleaves this protein here. Well, then uh, if it's cleaved, this product could be represented that bind that bound by the blue and the yellow antibodies could be shown here, and one that binds a smaller part uh, could be here. So proteases are always a problem. So when possible, use fresh samples. We never recommend uh, freezing your samples and then running it. It just increases the, the likelihood of a, a, prote a proteolysis. Uh, we do recommend using protease inhibitors and lysis buffers, you, you probably do. Sonicate where, when appropriate, but not too much because you can also cause fragmentation. Um, and then again, just trying to follow our PCG lysate uh, prep protocols, what we use for every uh, protein, every antibody that we show on the website. Another possibility to think about is not just proteolytic fragments, bad stuff happening, but it could represent actual biology. Uh, it could represent post translational modifications, it could represent alternative splicing or different isoforms of this of this protein they're expressed in different cell types. And so for this, we recommend going to uniprod.org. This is kind of a cheat sheet that tells you everything about the biochemistry from where it lives in the cell to the sequence to the different uh, PPMs of this. So it's a really spectacular resource to help make sense of the blunt you're looking at. So other, so other, other bands that you see are natural processing. So a great example of this is insulin, which starts in a pre-pro form and gets cleaved into various different uh, fragments. And so if you have an antibody that can, that can bind, that can recognize a part that is conserved throughout all these forms, you will see multiple bands. And in this case, it's not a bad thing, it's good. It means you can follow insulin throughout its life. So again, just before doing the experiment, research your protein carefully, go to Uniprot, and if, you, and if possible, it's not possible always, but to look at the appropriate cellular context uh, for your specific, uh, protein. Okay. So that was all the stuff below. Let's talk about the stuff above. So all of you guys are familiar with phosphorylation, dimerization, um, but also consider glycosylation. Again, uniprot.org is a great resource for finding out this type of information to make sense of your, to make sense of your results. So glycosylation changes significantly how proteins travel through the gel. So this figure is probably a little hard to kind of make out here, but here's a protein, it's about 50 kD, and then with these sugars here, um, it's about, it weighs about 60 kD if you were to put it on a, a molecular scale here. However, when you put it into a gel, remember the whole principle of Western bonding is that the FDS turns the protein into a light linear string, and therefore, you can, you can compare different proteins uh, by their mass. However, SDS doesn't, like, doesn't react very well with glycosylation. And so what that means is that the protein starts to uh, not to unwind quite as much and becomes thicker and does not travel nearly as quickly as it is expected to based upon its weight. 
And so what that means is that because SDS does not interact with it and does not kind of do what is expected, 10 kilodons sky constellation may result in more than 10 kilodons up the gel. And so unfortunately, this is a protein by protein basis. So when possible, do try to uh, check the check the literature on this protein. You can also do PN, you can also add PNJF to your samples to see if uh, glycosylation is the reason for this discrepancy, uh, which is a great which is a an enzyme that cleaves off uh, many sugars. Okay, so we've made sense of extra bands. Now we're into how to strengthen your signal. So again. Everything can kind of help influence your, your signal strength. I, but today I really want to focus on the membranes, on the transfer itself. So PVDF membrane is recommended almost always more than nitrocellulose. It has higher sensitivity than nitrocellulose. It has twice the binding capacity of nitrocellulose. It has hydrophobic and di dipole interactions. And um, besides that, and so let me just go on the right here. So on the on right here where I'm out is over the cursors over right now, this is the nitrocellulose. And so this interacts um, with this in a both an electrostatic way as well as a hydrophobic uh, method. Now, kind of what the issue here is that the hydrostatic, the ones that are more kind of like electricity positive, elect positive and negative interactions are the types of interactions that antibodies like to have. And so what that means is that you're almost competing with the membrane for your antibody. However, for, for the, um, for the TVDF, it's mostly hydrophobic interactions here. And so what that means is that there are more uh, epitopes that are available for your antibody to bind. PVDF is also more durable than nitrocellulose. And so for most of the time, this doesn't make too big of a deal. However, if you're stripping the membrane and re-blotting it, this is really, uh, this is really great. This is, uh, will last many more times of stripping and reprobing re than nitrocellulose. For low molecular weight proteins, we recommend using a special formulation of PVDF membranes called PSQ. These are, uh, this is a type of formulation made by a mobilon. These are for proteins that are 20, 25 uh, kilodons or less. And so low molecular weight proteins uh, are, can be very tricky to work with. And as I mentioned, we do recommend using a PSQ membrane. The most common mistake that I see uh, when reviewing uh, Western blots uh, is an over-transfer of low molecular weight proteins. Most proteins are kind of between the 30 and 50 KD. However, if, it, if your protein is like six kilodons, 15 kilodons, it's very easy to fly, for, fly through the membrane. And so we recommend to double check your transfer system settings. Um, the, a lot of people use the iBlot system and you should check the, the, the manual for how to do for, for that. Uh, and on the flip side, uh, for high molecular weight proteins, we do recommend uh, wet wet transfer and, but semi-dry is kind of your, your workhorse that'll work for most proteins. And something else to kind of keep in mind is to try to use a small pore size as possible. So we recommend a 0.2 mic micrometer uh, pore size for low molecular weight proteins. And as I mentioned, these are very fragile. Use fresh samples when, when possible. Okay, so now we've dealt with, with the signal and small molecular weight proteins. Let's talk about uh, some of the tweaking that you can do. So I'm just going to focus on kind of the washing. Again, washing is kind of the, the forgotten part of, of Western blotting. It can actually have quite a bit of importance to, to uh, helping get better signal. Um, if you do a longer wash, you tend to have lower background. If you increase the volume, you can also have a bit of a lower uh, background as well, as well as just using fresh uh, washing buffer each, each time can help uh, lower the background. Again, this won't be too much of an effect, but it is something to consider if you're just trying to get it just a little bit better for that publication. So for, for milk, for blocking, this can have a bit of a bit bigger impact. A longer period, such as I mentioned overnight, um, or a higher concentration of milk, as I said, up to 7%, uh, may also 
may also uh, may also help. However, if you uh, go a little bit too high, you may also lower your target signal. So uh, keep that in mind as you're doing these experiments. So we recommend using milk for most of the time. However, uh, five percent um, BSA can sometimes can sometimes help um, for some for some for probing some proteins. Um, something to keep in mind is that this is recommended strongly if you're if you're looking at a phospho epitope. Uh, BSA tends to be a little bit better at blocking nonspecific interactions and making sure that you aren't um, accidentally uh, cleaving the, the PO4 off. And so BSA is recommended for pho when you're looking at a phospho specific uh, protein. All right, so I, I yammered on for a, quite a while here, so. Um, here's a little summary table of, of what I kind of discussed, the main kind of tweaks and levers that you have. So for background, we recommend lowering antibody concentration, increasing blocking concentration duration, titrating your primary antibody, uh, increase your blocking time, lower exposure time, increase your washing, and optimize your lysis, lysis buffer. When looking for extra bands, uh, you know, use protease inhibitors and sonicate when appropriate, use fresh samples, and to really just understand the protein a little bit better. So understand the proteins post transitional modifications using Uniprot. And again, stay calm if you see glycosylation, you see significant uh, migration in the band location from the um, raw molecular weight. For signal strength issues, we recommend using a, a PVDF membrane, lowering your bucking concentration and duration in case that might, that might help as well. Um, loading 30 grams, micrograms or more protein, increasing your primary antibody concentration, and exposing for a longer time. And so with that, I want to thank you for listening today. And I know this is quick, but um, I hope that it kind of dusted off the cobwebs for you. And at this time, I'll start taking some questions. So please uh, use the question button on your, on your console there. And it uh, looks like we have a couple already here. So the first question is uh, that 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 I have that I see here is can you share the direct link to the Lysis protocol? Um, and yes, I will send that I will send that to you uh, later. Thank you for mentioning that. Um, I will add that I will add that to here, and then one of my colleagues may be able to add it to this presentation. Another question is: Do you characterize all your ep antibodies by epitope mapping? How can I know the actual amino acid sequence recognized by the antibody? This is a really great question. So for polyclonal antibodies, it's, it's nearly impossible. They're going to be hundred. They're going to be thousands, potentially thousands of different uh, epitopes. Um, and then for monoclonal, um, because we use large immunogens, hundred amino acids or more, and we're looking for a single epitope, it's, it's generally very hard. So epitope mapping can be quite challenging. It's something that can that that to do it right takes uh, can take a couple of years. So it's really challenging uh, to do exactly. However, uh, when using an ant however, when using one of our antibodies, you can you can look at the immunogen sequence and basically think of that as kind of where it's specific or where it should be binding. So I also see what kind of milk do you recommend for blocking? Um, thank you for that question. That's a really excellent question. So for that, um, I can you know you can use whatever kind of they're they're all basically the same. However, I'm very happy to um, add that as a add, uh, email that to you later um, to what exact brand that we that we use. I'll have to talk, ask uh, one of our purchasers on that question. Um, for phospho blotting, um, the major thing that I recommend is, as I mentioned, is, is using BS is using uh, BSA uh, as you're, as you're blocking. Um, other than that. It, you can just kind of run through the general protocol. Um, there aren't really too many other modifications that you can use for that. And then the last one is I have on here is what is the difference in effect of PBST or TBST used for washing uh, antibody incubation? Is, these, is it okay to use PBST for assaying uh, phosphoprotein? Um, that's a really good question. Unfortunately, I don't know the answer offhand, but I'll make sure that one of my colleagues reaches out to you after this uh, with a more definitive answer. And so, uh, thank you, thank you all for coming. And uh, any other, any final questions here before we sign off here? Just add them to the chat real quick. I'll wait a couple seconds more for anything else, and then we'll uh, be on our way here.
Okay. And so I don't see any other questions on, I don't see any other questions, but thank you guys so much. And you should be receiving a recording of this later um, in case I talk too fast or was too confusing. And um, as I mentioned, feel free to email me at will at ptglab.com if you have any other questions about uh, Western blotting. Thank you.